Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Conyers Davis. I'm the director of the Schwarzenegger Institute. Uh, formal welcomes will follow from our vice provost and other speakers, but I just wanted to cover a couple quick housekeeping issues. Uh, first, say thank you for coming. Also, just say thank you to our partners at UCLA, our partners here at USC. Uh, that are all supporting this initiative and this endeavor. Thank you to the county uh, for, for bringing this to our attention and allowing us to preview uh, this fantastic plan that I know the team at the county has been working on for two years. Um, but before, you don't really need to hear from me. There's somebody that we're going to interrupt quickly uh, that wants to say hello. Uh, he couldn't be here because he's uh, on working on Terminator Dark Fate, but uh, that's why we have these great plasmas, and we're hoping to go to uh, a FaceTime call with Governor Schwarzenegger. Hey, sorry for, <laughs> sorry for the interruption, but uh, we've got 250 people here at USC that are about to discuss the County of Los Angeles' new sustainability plan, but I know you wanted to say a quick hello. We have Supervisor Mark Ridley-Thomas here, our Vice Provost um, uh, Mark Todd. So, uh, we also have Gary Giroux, uh, the Chief Sustainability Officer, and our Environmental Policy Director, Fran Pavley. But Governor, we want to hear from you. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm right now in the middle uh, of an interview for a French movie magazine. <laughs> and so, uh, so I hope that you uh, understand that I'm not, I cannot be there at the same time because this is not movie magic, this is the real life, this is the real world. But the bottom line is, is that I just want to say a call in and just say thank you very much for the effort you're making. And thank you for UCLA and USC Schwarzenegger Institute and LA County and everyone working together to create sustainability because I think it's very clear California is uh, the leading state in the United States when it comes to uh, sustainability and green energy and the green future. We are the example, the perfect example for other states and also for other parts of the world. And so it pleases me when I see all this great brain power and two universities and, uh, um, you know, uh, Thomas, uh, really Thomas uh, being involved in the whole thing, who is a great leader, not only in healthcare and education, but also in sustainability. Uh, and the, all of you working together. So I think that we have to solve the problems, not only for Los Angeles or for Los Angeles County, but we have to solve the problems because uh, that's we can be the model for other cities and for other counties around this country and around the world. And as I told you, with our um, you know kind of a, a digital handbook uh, where people can copy our policies and our laws, uh, I think here's another way where people can copy what we are doing here and the great leadership that we are showing. So I just want to say thank you to everyone. Sorry that I cannot be there myself, but uh, I'll be back. <laughs> thank you, Governor. See you all. Bye. 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 Ciao. Thank you so much. Well, that's what's exciting about Los Angeles. You have that great intersection of entertainment and, and deep public policy, which we're about to discuss today. Uh, but uh, you don't need to hear from me. We have our vice provost, Mark Todd, here. He's going to welcome everybody, say a couple of words. So with no further ado, uh, vice provost, thank you. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to USC. My name is Mark Todd. I'm the Vice Provost for Academic Operations. And uh, I am very impressed that USC and UCLA have put aside their crosstown rivalry <laughs> to host this terrific event. I think for you know, important issues like this, uh, we should agree to work together and put our collective brain, brain power towards them and uh, you know, relegate our rivalries to much, much less important things like football. <laughs> Um, you know, when it comes to thinking about some of the most complex issues facing the world today, like sustainability or uh, homelessness or immigration, they can only be, um, you can only make headway when the brightest minds in academia and business and the nonprofit sector and uh, the government come together with their expert perspectives and the spirit of collegiality. And uh, I'm very thankful to the USC Schwarzenegger Institute and the UCLA Luskin Center for doing just that, bringing this group 
Uh, the brain power in this room is obviously more than I can handle, um, but bringing folks like you together to preview the LA County uh, Sustainability Plan. In 2015, USC launched its Sustainability 2020 initiative, uh, focused on uh, research and education, community engagement, um, uh, sustainability, uh, energy, um, sustainability, I'm sorry, um, en energy conservation, sustainable transportation and procurement, uh, waste diversion and water conservation. And we're on track to meet most of those goals by uh, the end of 2020. Uh, a key partner in those initiatives has been the USC Schwarzenegger Institute, which is committed to post-partisanship and um, has been a global and local leader in action against climate change for many years. Another of our key partners is the Wrigley Environmental Studies Institute on Catalina Island. And many of our faculty around this university are researching this really important issue. Uh, we're also uh, excited to have our new president, Dr. Carol Fault, and she's an environmental researcher herself. And she's committed to making sustainability one of her key strategic initiatives for the university. Uh, and also, there's no doubt that Los Angeles County is a leader in advancing sustainable initiatives while maintaining and achieving economic prosperity. And this plan is a testament to that. Uh, personally, I'm uh, really happy to see, to see that equity is a pillar of this plan alongside the economy and the environment. And uh, I want to thank the county leadership and uh, the chief sustainability officer of the county, Gary Giroux, and all the community-based organizations that have come together uh, to, to put this document together. And it's, uh, there's a lot of heavy lifting to be done, but we're all here to lend our expertise and uh, help make it happen. So thank you for being here. Um, please join me in bringing one of the key supporters of this plan to the podium, uh, Supervisor Mark Ridley-Thomas. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give Todd another big round of applause, won't you, please? Uh, we're pleased to be here today to acknowledge an important opportunity for us to think together about that which is important. Um, I think it's um, clear that when we bring uh, premier academic institutions together, bright minds, um, thinking about how we understand the timeliness of the issue, the efficacy of what's at place, uh, gathering around uh, uh, a green agenda, an agenda that speaks to environmentalism, uh, an agenda that understands environmental responsibility uh, as well as environmental justice, then we are doing what we should do. Uh, we want to th say from the top, thank you to all of you for doing that. Um, Shout out to one who is a mentor in this area well before many showed up uh, in the California State Legislature, served in the Assembly and the Senate. She's the Honorable Fran Pavley. We should give her a big round of applause. Uh, uh, Fran says I gave her a shout out because we were seatmates uh, in the Assembly and the Senate, and therefore uh, relationships, they do matter. Uh, but more importantly, she was a leading light on these questions. And we think about greenhouse gases and the range of things, um, AB 32 and more. It was Fran Pavley. Fran Pavley. Fran Pavley. Give her another round of applause. It was Fran Pavley. <laughs> uh, you'll understand what I mean by that at some point. Gary Giroux and the whole team at the county's uh, Office of Sustainability is in the house. We ought to acknowledge them, give them a big round of applause. Thank you, Gary. Ladies and gentlemen, in the county of Los Angeles, as you well know, the largest county in the United States of America, we speak the language of green and open space. Um, that came to us in terms of our priorities and policy making, took it to the ballot. We called it Measure H, which the voters of this county passed resou uh, resoundingly. 
And then we talked about reducing our, our vehicles, mile travel through significant investment in public transportation. It's not about transportation alone, it's about the environment. Someone says, if it was Ron Miller, he says not about transportation or the environment, it's about jobs for working men and women and construction. But Measure M passed for environmental implications. Then we said water quality matters and conservation opportunities. Therefore, the people spoke and Measure W passed. Well, we're not going to exhaust the alphabet this morning. I'm just simply here to say that the county has been on the case. We are thinking smarter um, about implementing with more uh, care and confidence and we have a plan to do more of the same. So sustainability is not, not just about the environment. It's about balancing what we describe as competing priorities. Uh, the plan that is emerging uh, is broad by design so as to address the needs and the concerns of people uh, from all walks of life. Think not in terms of a monolith, think in terms of the diversity of views that produced, that will produce a balanced set of outcomes. And what's uh, been important to me was to see that equity and workforce development opportunities uh, were at the center in many ways of what we have been trying to accomplish. And so we need to think about jobs, jobs and more jobs, uh, economic opportunity for people in this county. And so the plan seeks to build on this by making Los Angeles home to new, clean industries and green jobs, not to the exclusion of other things. We can do all of it integrated and make pros progress. So we think about water, we think about clean manufacturing, we think about construction tied to our housing crisis, we think about transportation, and we articulate these things in the context of the range of opportunities we have in this extraordinary part of the nation in which we reside and we can make things better. And so that's what's uh, before us. Uh, that's essentially why I'm here, just to say a word about we want those of you who are professionals to reflect the diversity of our county. That's what it means to be an Angelino. Think not uh, ethnically when we think about diversity alone. Think about the next generation of architects and engineers and more who will contribute to the well-being of this region. And so we're ready to get to work. And I'm confident that the county is poised to use its procurement power. And there's a lot of power uh, attached to the procurement capacity in the county. It's land use authority and it's economic and workforce development incentives uh, to support the growth of a cleaner economy and a stronger and more vibrant region. So I ask you to hold us accountable to this, to stay engaged as we seek to harness our collective intellect and resolve to not just talk about these things, but to be about these things, to do these things, and future generations will be better for it. I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Supervisor. It's a real honor to have you here at uh, USC today and uh, to bring these two universities together and all the great work you're doing on the plan. Uh, next up to talk about the plan and walk us through it and, and why we should all be so excited about it is Los Angeles County's Chief Sustainability. Well, before we, I introduce Gary, look, can we all just give the Supervisor one more round of applause? We, we know how the pressure's on your time. We know how important supervisors are. And so the, the fact that you were able to come and join us is just, just tr terrific. So thank you. Um, now, to where I was. Uh, I'd like to introduce Los Angeles County's Chief Sustainability Officer, Gary Giroux. Gary's a longtime friend of the Schwarzenegger Institute. He was a good friend of my predecessor uh, here at the Schwarzenegger Institute, Bonnie Reese. Uh, I know he works very closely with Fran Pavley. Uh, he's just an all-around wonderful person, so it's uh, a real honor and, uh, to welcome you as well. And we're excited to hear what you're going to tell us about the plan and uh, what we have to look forward to. Thank you.
Thank you, Conyers, for that. And yes, uh, it's been uh, it's been a long run with the Schwarzenegger Institute. I've been happy to be part of uh, the work that that gets on done here, and it's been great work. And uh, of course, we all miss Bonnie. She did tremendous work uh, leading this organization at the beginning. So I want to start, I think, by uh, having a little bit of a mind exercise and, and think about uh, what would happen if we took the metropolitan, or metro as it's now called, the Metropolitan Transportation Agency, SCAG, the AQMD, I don't know, throw in some other regional agencies and combine them all together into one large mega regional agency. And you might say that's a crazy idea. In fact, lots of people thought it was a crazy idea when, when Willie Brown, then uh, Senate president, proposed it in, in, a, in a bill some 20 years ago. He said, we need regional approaches. And he had the exact same structure in the Bay Area, where the San Francisco MTA and the Bay Area Association of Governments and the Bay Area AQMD would come together in a single agency and actually have enforcement power over land use and transportation and housing. And all of these things that are so critical to us, but we can't seem to always get done when we're, when we're, we're separated. And of course, that bill didn't go anywhere. And I suspect uh, uh, Willie Brown, when he became mayor of San Francisco, had a different point of view on ceding some power to a, a broad regional agency. But I was a young analyst, actually, in the city of Los Angeles uh, at the time in our environmental affairs department. And Supervisor Ridley Thomas was then council member uh, in the city. And this was an idea that actually struck me. Uh, and it struck me so much that it has stayed with me through my career. How do we promote regional approaches? And so when the chief sustainability officer job was created in the county, this was the point of view I brought forward. And I said, if you hire me, and this may not be your vision, but my vision would be to create uh, a regional approach within the county, within the 88 cities, to really try to work together, not to force it, not to create some new structure, but really to encourage the county and cities to work together and use the power of the county, which is tremendous, uh, to actually support cities and help cities become more sustainable. And the reason for that is, is that these issues are regional in scale. If you think about stormwater or air pollution or complete streets or the urban heat island effect or any other sustainability issue that you can name, they don't stop at the borders of cities. And we've got 88 cities in this region. And so we need to understand and figure out a process for engaging everybody. And that vision, I think, actually is exactly aligned with the Board of Supervisors. I'll tell you a, a, a little bit of a story here, not to deviate too much, but the, the, the county had put forward to the board the idea of uh, creating a community choice energy program. Uh, this was back in, in 2016. And the, the, the presentation to the board was, we should do this for unincorporated areas. It's a great idea. And here's the, the business plan to move forward. The board said, we love the idea, but why wouldn't we share it with all of the cities uh, all of the, uh, in the region? Why wouldn't we create a regional entity? And they were hiring me. And so that was my very first assignment as the chief sustainability officer to go out and recruit cities into a regional uh, community choice energy program, which today is the largest program in the entire United States serving 3 million customers with energy that's 56% renewable. Uh, 10 of the 32 cities in it have 100% renewable energy today. So that's why the sustainability plan, as we started to craft the sustainability plan, really took the idea of how do we create a regional plan and what, what are the mechanisms to get there. Uh, and so one of the first things we did is we called cities in and said, hey, we're going to do this. What do you think? How can we work together? How do we develop this plan together? Uh, but what, the other thing that we did is we actually went out and listened. We, we said, before we write a single word of this plan, we're going to hear from the people. Because there's real expertise on the ground in our communities that we needed to tap into. 
And so we went out on, a, on a, essentially a listening tour. Uh, we held 150 meetings uh, with all kinds of stakeholders, business interests, labor, uh, environmental community, academics, you name it. We talked to them uh, and listened to them. And then we held a series of workshops. And the workshops were critical element to writing the plan because we uh, hired five environmental justice organizations, the East Yards Communities for Environmental Justice, Communities for a Better Environment, SCOPE, Pacoima Beautiful, and Day One. And we said, could you help us organize within your communities, within your, your stakeholders, to bring people to our workshops that wouldn't typically come? And we, in fact, had 350 organizations, some 600 people, come through a series of 11 half-day, six-hour workshops where we said, we haven't written a plan. We want you to help us write it. Tell us your good ideas. Through that, we gathered 6,000 ideas on what the sustainability plan should contain. Now, Supervisor Ridley Thomas could tell you, if I came forward to a, the board with a plan that had 6,000 ideas, I don't think it would get adopted on the first pass. So we had to refine, of course. And so we did that. And we worked with the community groups. We narrowed it down to the draft that came out uh, in April. In April, there was a plan that had 150 specific actions. So we really worked hard to refine and consolidate those 6,000 ideas. Sometimes they weren't ideas that we thought could fit within the plan, and we've referred those on to the agencies that, that do uh, that work. So we could say, look, we held this process. We got these good ideas. Here they are. I hope you can use them. Um, but our vision for it was that this would be the boldest, most ambitious sustainability plan anywhere in the United States. Uh, and I think we've achieved that vision with what we put out in April. But it wasn't done. We needed to continue to, to do work. And so we took public comment. We actually had a seven-week-long public comment period. We, we gathered about 800 specific comments on the plan from some 200 parties. Uh, and we've been working now to, to refine and revise the plan uh, so that we can present it to the Board of Supervisors, which we plan to do actually at the end of this month. So uh, as Conyers says, this is a, a bit of a preview. And the plan is structured, just so you have a sense of kind of how we thought about the plan. There's 12 broad cross-cutting goals. And those are the chapters, if you will. These are not chapters that are a water chapter and a, and a parks chapter and a climate chapter and a housing chapter, because what we heard from the community. What we heard from all of those stakeholders that we talked to was, these things are all interrelated. You can't pull them apart. Uh, you know, a good example of that is if uh, you imagine we're going to implement some project to, to address stormwater, to collect stormwater. How you might do that is through some parks and open space. So you've got a stormwater project, you've got a water quality project, but now you've got a parks and open space project. And if you're infiltrating that water, you're reducing the need to import water from Northern California. And if that's the case, you're reducing the energy used to transport that water to Southern California. So now you've got a, a water project, a parks project, and an energy project. And of course, if you reduce energy uh, generation and consumption, you reduce air pollution, you reduce climate pollution, and you improve the public health. So one thing touches six. And the plan is organized that way. So there's the 12 chapters. You'll see in that uh, that uh, those are interrelated. They represent the intersectionality of these issues. But for every action, and every uh, there's 150 or so of them, we identify the topic tags. So if you want to go online and you're only interested in uh, transportation, you can click on transportation, and you can get all of the actions that touch transportation, or whatever the case may be. Every one of the actions is well lists a county department that is specifically responsible for its implementation. So we will be holding, uh, as the supervisor said, hold us accountable. We will be holding ourselves accountable for the implementation of the plan. Uh, and that will happen through the process of the department head's management performance evaluations. We, as the chief sustainability office, will be reporting uh, annually to the board on how the progress we're making. We're putting up a public dashboard uh, of the data that we've collected, and we'll be updating that real time so you can see if we're making progress or not uh, in, in, in a real public and transparent way. 
And as an aside, I'll say that data that we collected, we collected a lot of data thanks to our partners at UCLA. Um, we have actually disaggregated almost all of that data, probably two thirds or more of that data, down to the city scale. So we're gonna hand to, to each of the 88 cities a set of baseline conditions for their community. We're gonna hand them the plan and say, here's a template, take it, use it, write it, create your own sustainability plan in your community, and then we'll give them model ordinances and tools to implement the, the plan itself. As we develop our programs, we're gonna be continuing to work with cities to develop theirs. And the reason why, I, I talked about the importance of this sort of regional approach, but the reason why working with cities is so critical is in the United States, about 80% of the population, according to the federal government, lives in an urban area, what's called a metropolitan statistical area. 60% or so of that lives in a city of about 60,000 people. So half of the US population lives in an urban area, but lives in a small city. And that's exactly Los Angeles in a microcosm. You think about Los Angeles with 10 million people, 40% live in the city of LA, and if I asked you all to raise your hands if you didn't live in the city of LA, I bet you 60% of you would raise your hands and say, yep, I'm, I'm in Arcadia or Hawthorne or Whittier or Carson, or I could go on because there's 88 of them and I'm not going to. Um, but there are, people live uh, in Los Angeles, but they live in smaller jurisdictions, and so we want to work with those jurisdictions. So. Just to give you some of the details, and I don't want to go on too long, but you know, the plan calls for some very ambitious targets. We're looking at carbon neutrality. Uh, and when we set targets in the plan, so we, we set them for the county as a whole, these are regional collective goals, but also for the county unincorporated area, because we're going to hold ourselves accountable. And in some cases, for the county's own facilities and operations. Uh, and so we set targets around carbon neutrality. We say 2050 for carbon neutrality, but for uh, region-wide, but for the county unincorporated, we're calling for 2045. So we're gonna sh lead by example on getting to carbon neutrality. We also say we're gonna get to 100% renewable energy in county unincorporated by 2025. We're gonna use the power we created with the Clean Power Alliance to, to advance renewable energy within our communities. Uh, we're looking at 80% of getting 80% of our water locally, so starting to really decrease that imports of water by collecting and, and managing our waters locally. Well, we've got very ambitious, audacious, audacious zero emission transportation targets. We've been working closely with uh, the Clean Tech Incubator, I see Mike Swords here, and their Transportation Electrification Partnership. Uh, to, with uh, the city of Los Angeles and with Edison and with DWP and with Metro to really advance and promote electric and zero emission transportation in our communities today. And the reason for that is that we want Los Angeles to be uh, the hub for zero emission transportation. We already have three electric bus manufacturers in LA County today. We can use that uh, as the starting point for creating a real zero emission transportation industry in Los Angeles, design, manufacturing, maintenance, parts supply, the whole value chain, and we can become that, and that's part of our vision. We are focused on equity and, and the importance of equity, and so we understand that uh, Los Angeles in particular has communities that are and have historically been uh, discriminated against and, and disproportionately impacted by pollution. Uh, this is not a surprise to anybody, and so there's a lot in the plan that looks at addressing those historic inequities. And an example of that is our, our Green Zones program, where we see, if you go down to Lenox or Firestone or any other parts of uh, some of our unincorporated communities, you'll see a metal finisher or a, or a, a, a salvage yard next door to a school or a residence. And that kind of inappropriate adjacent land use simply creates so many uh, health issues for our, our communities that need to be addressed. 
That said, we're not going to just put those places out of business because those are jobs. And the people in those communities work in those jobs. And so we need to find ways to make cleaner, more environmentally sound uh, businesses within those, uh, within those same areas so that you can continue to have a strong, thriving economy, uh, but one in which workers are safer and healthier because they're not working in a toxic facility and the neighbors are safer and healthier. Uh, so we really want to push all of these issues through the sustainability plan. I could go on because there are 150 things uh, at this point, but I'm not going to detail all of them. Uh, I will say that uh, we firmly believe that uh, there will be a tremendous amount of job opportunity and growth as a result of this plan. We have a housing deficit. It's not a surprise to anybody that we need more housing, that the homeless crisis is truly a crisis. Our plan says we shall build 500,000 new units in LA County just to meet the demand we have. We should be meeting those kinds of targets. And if we're really going to aggressively push housing, and we've put some tools in there to do that, there will be tremendous amount of growth in the construction industry. So let me conclude just by saying that I firmly believe that in the old, this old saying that says, where there's opportunity, uh, or where there's crisis, rather, there is opportunity. And we are facing a real crisis today in our communities, whether it's a climate crisis or a homeless crisis or, or an energy or water or economic crisis. And we have the ability through the sustainability plan to provide Los Angeles with good quality, clean jobs uh, that are safer and healthier for our communities. And we have the opportunity to provide entrepreneurs with new areas for investment to grow or continue to grow our economy for the long term in a sustainable way. So with that, I say thank you all very much for being here today. I really appreciate USC and UCLA for putting this event together uh, and enjoy the day. We've got a great couple of panels coming up. But why not uh, take an opportunity to please introduce uh, Senator Fran Pavley, who uh, who's, I think Supervisor Ridley Thomas said it best, is, uh, is just a, a leader beyond belief on this issue. Um, but she's going to introduce, she's going to moderate our next panel uh, uh, once everybody's seated. Um, and I just also say that one of the great joys I have working at the Schwarzenegger Institute is getting to work with Senator Pavley on a re regular basis. So thank you, Senator. Over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Okay, good. Uh, I'm a former middle school teacher, so if I sound like one, there's a reason for it. Uh, Mr. Ridley Thomas, no talking. Um, uh, no. <laughs> uh, Mark, thank you very much for coming, and it was an honor serving with you in the legislature. Keep up the good work in the county. Thank you, sir. You get to know legislators, you know, in those 12-hour sessions quite, quite well. And I think we bonded on Southwest Airlines going back and forth um, between Burbank, sort of a captive audience there. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. And I just wanted to, again, acknowledge sort of, I don't know if it's historic or not, but I'm just thrilled, JR, that USC and UCLA are uh, working together on this issue. And it's been pointed out by several people, there are no boundary lines when it comes to some of these challenges and opportunities that we face together. And so why not have uh, two of the most outstanding institutions in LA County uh, working collaboratively together along with all of you in the room. And what a room full of people. And I hope uh, when we get to lunch at about one o'clock um, that you have a chance to network and get to know each other because together we can do great things. So this panel is titled Supporting Business Growth for a Green Economy. And if you're in this room and you're not in favor of that, <laughs> that's a problem. So now it's just a transition on how we get there. The goal of this panel is to discuss how to promote and expand new businesses and job opportunities in LA County the most populous county in the United States. Supervisor Kuehl reminds me of that. But think of the potential with that. You know, I, uh, after spending 14 years in the legislature, I got a little tired of the San Francisco area 
claiming to be the center of clean technology. Yeah, yeah Silicon Valley d had their moment in the sun, but why not LA County as we move forward? Think of the purchasing power. Um, Supervisor Ridley Thomas talked about procurement power. The potential is amazing, not only for a model, but the diversity of our, our wonderful county, small cities, some cities like Agora Hills, sort of like something out in the you know, middle of the country, and then big urban environments like the city of Los Angeles. What an opportunity. And I think um, uh, Gary, who spoke at the beginning, mentioned that the CCAs, the clean power authorities, are bringing together this more regional approach to solving problems. This builds on that, and I can't think of a better person than leading the efforts on sustainability than uh, Gary Giroux. And so wherever he is, um, thank you, Gary. So um, I work for Governor Schwarzenegger now, and uh, it, it's sort of fun to hang out with him, is it, is it not? <laughs> but um, I worked with him because he signed most of my bills. So I actually, <laughs> and also Bonnie Reese asked me to uh, work for the Schwarzenegger Institute, and if you know Bonnie Reese, you really can't say no. You know you're going to end up there, and so this is this is what happened, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, but I learned from Governor Schwarzenegger when he was signing AB 32. He said, you know, we don't have to choose. I can't talk like he does. Anyone who has that accent can do this, but we don't have to choose between a healthy economy and a healthy environment. We can do both, and he was determined to show that we could. And as we look back at the signing of AB 32, that's back in 2006, seems like a long time ago, he wanted to send strong market signals for investment and innovation in clean technologies. We also wanted to reduce climate and air pollution as part of that package. And we look back at these targets we created to reach them by 2020, and we have met and exceeded those targets. So the model works. It's how you implement it, just like a county sustainability plan that matters. The new businesses and job opportunities, as well as reducing climate and air pollution, were achieved on time, but we know we need to do more not only because of the climate crisis, but the growing population. Even in LA County, when I hear about the air quality and ozone levels because of heat episodes getting worse, you know we have to double down on what we're doing. SB 32, um, I tend to keep the same numbers in all my bills so I can remember them easily, extends the targets to 2030. Why did we need to do that? Well. Yes, the science matters, but more, just as importantly, sending those market signals that these policies are going to stay in place for another at least 12 years, and so the investment opportunities are clear. So let's have today's panel of experts discuss the LA County Sustainability Plan as a vehicle to create and accelerate the demand for issues such as advanced transportation, renewable energy, waste management, energy efficiency, urban greening, and workforce development. All of these are important. LA County, not just Silicon Valley, you can tell I have issues still from being up in Sacramento, which is very close to the Bay Area, has the opportunity to become the new leader in this new environment. What is the best way to integrate climate resilience and economic development? There is evidence that businesses are choosing sustainable cities. I tend to uh, try to listen to a webinar every week, and I was struck with one um, presented by Mark Hartman, he's the Chief Sustainability Officer for Phoenix, who commented that Moody's Global Investors are now including sustainability criteria in their credit ratings. So this is a smart business decision, and I think it's a smart environmental decision. So. This is the format for the panel. Each of the expert panelists will be speaking for five minutes each on an overview uh, on the topic of this panel. Uh, then I'll ask one or two hopefully provocative questions, and then we'll open up for Q&A. And panel two, and I'm watching the clock, will begin at about noon, and JR will be the wrap-up show before lunch. 
So let's go on with that. And let me give some very brief introductions. And I'm sure online you can find more extensive ones. I loved reading the biographies of our four panelists. Uh, right next to me is Bob Keefe. If you haven't met Bob Keefe, you'll want to meet him. He's the executive director of E2. E2 stands for Environmental Entrepreneurs. They have chapters in many states from Boston to San Diego. They began in California. My first, first year in office in 2001, it was E2 and I that worked together on tailpipe emission bills. They didn't tell me that was their first time they were in Sacramento. It was my first time as well and we bonded ever since. But Bob has an interesting background. More than 20 years as a former political and business journalist. He also went to, you're a Tar Heel, correct? Yeah. University of North Carolina. We have another panelist here. Sam, you're holding up the other end. Uh, Senior Manager of Government Relations for the Western Region for BYD. Everyone knows them, the electric bus company, manufactured right here in LA County in Lancaster. Prior to that, he worked for Solar City and Tesla. He was a clean energy policy and chief of staff in the House of Representatives. You'll have to tell me which representative that is and worked in the Obama administration on clean energy. Oh, but did I mention he graduated from USC? <laughs> Fida. Uh, Mia Lair founded MLA, a business which is recognized for sustainable and progressive landscape design, including people-friendly spaces. I talked to Mia briefly. I didn't realize she had done all the design on the Annenberg Beach House, if you haven't seen it. Isn't that an amazing? amazing place. She's now busy with a small little project called the uh, Rams Ellick uh, Football Stadium. Um, that, that probably keeps you a little bit busy. And the Lucas. And the Lucas, George <laughs> Lucas thing. Uh, the LA Natural History Museum Gardens and uh, many of the LA River projects. So I can't wait, wait to hear what she has to say on sustainable landscape design and architecture. She went to a small little back east college you might have heard of called Harvard. <laughs> Mary Leslie is also on the panel. She's president of the LA Business County Council since 2001. A perfect messenger for this panel today on her ability to inform and unite businesses, government, academic, and nonprofit sectors to strengthen LA's county's economic competitiveness as well as quality of life. I read about all the boards and advisory committees you are on. You are a busy person, but that keeps you so connected, not just in LA politics, but throughout the county. So I appreciate that too. Now, she's politically correct here. She has a master's degree in public administration from USC, but also attended UCLA's Anderson School of Management program. So well done. <laughs> so let's start with Bob but a five minute background on um, what E2 does in this space. Sure, sure why not? And, and uh, I, I can't claim that I am a Trojan, but I did do a, uh, a, a fairly lengthy new media fellowship here at USC 20 some years ago, back when uh, new media uh, was nothing like the new media that we have today. So it's, it's great to be here and thanks for having me. Again, my name is Bob Keefe. I'm the executive director of E2. Environmental Entrepreneurs, and as Senator Pavley said, uh, we actually got our start here in California 20 years ago working on something called the Pavley Bill. And uh, we did so because we th there were uh, other business organizations, if you will, that were saying, oh, if we limit tailpipe emissions from vehicles in California, well, that's just going to ruin the auto industry, it's going to ruin the petroleum industry, and California is going to float off into the ocean and go to hell in the handbasket. And our founders stood up. They were Silicon Valley business people mainly. And, and they said, now, wait a minute. We actually know a little thing about innovation. And, and we understand that uh, policies send market signals that can change markets. And uh, uh, at the time, they were thinking, you know, and if that happens, maybe those Prius thingies that we've been hearing about, those hybrid vehicles, might be, become a little more popular. And who knows, even go figure, electric vehicles someday. Uh, and lo and behold, that's exactly, of course, what happened. Because of legislation like Senator Pavley's, 
there are now uh, about 253,000 people working in clean vehicles, manufacturing and parts all across the country. That's ranging from Fremont to, of course, Detroit to Tesla's battery factory in, uh, in Sparks, Nevada. Um, so since then, E2 has grown, as, as the senator mentioned, to about nine chapters stretching from New England and New York to here in Los Angeles and, and San Diego. We've got about 5,000 business people, uh, members, and supporters. The one thing they have in common is that they realize that um, the economy and the environment are not at odds. And in fact, they rely on each other. And so we work to advance policies that are good for the economy good for the environment. And uh, what we found here in California, what we found all over the country is that policy matters, right? Policy matters when it comes to uh, driving clean energy, driving clean energy jobs, and, uh, and economic growth and investments all over the country. There's a reason that today in California, more than 500,000 people work in clean energy and renewables and energy efficiency and clean vehicles. There's a reason right here in uh, greater LA that 162,000 uh, Californians now work in clean energy. Uh, it's because of the smart policies that Senator Pavley and others pioneered here in California, and it's because of smart policies like the uh, sustainability plan that, that the county is now uh, uh, developing that I think is going to create a lot more jobs and drive growth in this, in this county as well. So, Thank you very much, Bob. Usually, I start my uh, presentation um, about the LA River with a clip of uh, the governor going down the LA River and exploding in Studio City uh, up against a, uh, with a bicycle. And I always think, <gasps> what happened to that oil when it got down to the ocean? So today, I didn't want to show it because, you know, I'm sure it got cleaned up before it got there. Um, and. Um, Across the country, to, to your point about the, the value of the, our, uh, our sort of policies and uh, leadership in California, I've been pretty busy in California, um, but, and my peers across the country criticize me for being a, a regionalist. Oh, she's just a regionalist. And I always say, well, if I wasn't surrounded by amazing policymakers and leaders who really believed in the future, of uh, the green industries and technologies, and uh, if I wasn't hadn't been trained as a landscape architect, you know, maybe it wouldn't be so interesting. But every project that we do, including the project I spent time with you on um, not too long ago in Agura Hills, which was the uh, the crossing. So what I'm going to do is quickly share what landscape architects do, so you all know. Because if nothing else, maybe I'll get some young people um, that you mentor or that are here. Uh, sort of interested in the profession. Um, so what we do know is that landscape matters, that water matters, that ecology matters, that parks matter, and that people matter, because let's not forget that. Um, and uh, landscape architects were trained to move in the confluence of the natural and the urban form. As the medium that we move through and, and over, Landscape provides opportunities to shift not just the performance of our cities, but our everyday experience of everything we do, contributing to community health, well-being, economy, and resilience. Ultimately, landscape matters. It's not just trees and shrubs. The sustainability plan. Well, Gary's not here to, for me to uh, basically compliment him and the team for an amazing process as a, a small cog in the wheel. It was really fantastic. Uh, one of the best experiences I've had in a large um, planning project like this. And uh, it's a plan that, of course, balances the environment, uh, equity, and the economy. And um, our responsibility was uh, park access and ecological strategies, just the the fact that ecological strategies was mentioned was, of course, incredibly um, important to us. And so Im improving accessibility, talking about the urban forest as a, as a factor. Um, of course, with carbon trading, that became a factor for some of us some time ago. And thank you for the work you did and uh, uh, others in, in the legislature. Um, and. Um, so these are the kinds of diagrams that we do here. Oops, I haven't forwarded. Um, oh, I am forwarding. 
for me, um, the, uh, that really tries to balance the ecosystem, uh, social system as we move forward and creating plans um, and helping with uh, the regulation of the climate, disease, water purification and pollination and all the little nuances we get into in terms of the environmental protection um, to the point of cultivation and fertilization. So uh, the, the plan recommends how human services can provide a give back or give back to the ecosystem, including the, the creation of this habitat. So um, the opportunities that we have across LA County, um, and I, I, it's really a metropolitan area, are tremendous. Um, and of course we have, I don't even, it's a little depressing to talk about how many square miles of asphalt and uh, urban or unbuilt up land that we have, but you know, f let's uh, suffice it to say that in LA County there's, there's 1,800 square miles of paving uh, and, in, and the potential of impervious surfaces uh, is great. So the Forest Service is salivating as we move forward. Um, in uh, 2016, uh, the National Wildlife Federation hired us to analyze the, connect, uh, the issues of connectivity for habitat. As you know, the, there's been tremendous is interest in our mountain lions and um, the other populations. So we did a series of analysis of certain taxa and what it is that we needed to do to help them survive. So as we move forward with any of the projects that are of larger scale and impact that we start understanding w what it is that we are, how we're improving and certainly the life of the mountain lion, but more. And some of this uh, uh, funding for this work came from a, a, a great, um, uh, foundation, the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation. And part of the reason they actually got interested was because we could, could, because we could create these nice maps that helps them understand the issues. Um, so, um, a, if, so, we, so now people and how uh, we get there. Uh, we, we worked on the LA River Revitalization Master Plan, which was completed in 2007. Uh, it was at a time when um, there'd been a lot of work on the part of the policymakers, and uh, certainly the Army Corps of Engineers, including. Um, there were some issues with, especially with water quality and just general soil and uh, land use pollution, and how do we improve uh, the value of these corridors to in the future. So you see here a cross-reference of all the kinds of uh, areas that we were trying to sort of uh, sort of address and the city had grown in many ways out of control and um, so did other cities in the country, bridling our rivers and streams and paving over vast areas of the city. So I always say that it's created you know, about 10,000 acres of land that we now can improve um, because uh, they are, un you know, basically the land uses don't fit, rail is changing, transportation's changing, and there's a renewed interest in of course, um, the the environment and uh, improving the quality of life in our cities. So enhancing flood storage, water quality, quality and contributing to the restoration of ecosystems and the health of the adjacent communities might have been the first, uh, was very much a uh, the framework of the study, but starting to think of how you solve problems with multi-benefit solutions. So as the city continues to make strides and how do you incorporate rail and to the river and come in and under rail, or um, on the left side, an image of uh, what uh, projects like the Taylor Yards parcel, which is now being studied and what that could look like. So Taylor Yards is uh, in, between the state and the city at 100 acres parcel in, the, in, the, in, uh, in mile 26 of the city, so if it's 52 miles, it's uh, mile 26. And there's a tremendous amount of work going on here. Of course, we have soil, we have rail, and we have power towers to dream. But it is a dream, and it's a, a gem um, that we all um, hope uh, will find ourselves in the next 10 years 
um, enjoying uh, parkland that really uh, sort of uh, addresses the need for parks and air quality in our cities, um, improving um, and also uh, addressing the issue of water and water attenuation, but at the same time, water collection. In the lower river, people have, uh, the agencies, the county, the state have started to do um, and some of the nonprofits and conservancy are starting to do some additional work. This is the confluence of the Rio Hondo and the LA River. We have a lot of nonprofits like Trust for Public Land working in these areas and really trying to make some of these projects become real, become viable, and uh, in incorporate some of the sort of goals of the uh, <laughs> county plan as part of uh, these improvements. Um, so uh, as you can see, Without not, uh, not very large projects uh, yet underway, we actually have developed bikeways and uh, trails and places to sit. And uh, if you all might have read uh, some recipes for fish from the river last Friday, uh, please sort of uh, think of uh, what your sushi might be like in, in this next generation. Uh, but, and of course, the, the fauna is back and has been here and resilient. So now to go to, um, to in big infill projects that are, can make a big difference. And the reason I'm going to show this in part is when the, uh, that it was very hard for people to imagine how a stadium and a new infill in the old racetrack would actually create a major carbon uh, forest and urban forest. We're planting in phase one alone, 5,000 trees. Uh, we are uh, creating infill development, including office and residential. Uh, there are about 10,000 people working on the site as we speak. Um, we're buying water from West Basin, and then basically uh, using the, the location of the original uh, uh, lake and creating a place uh, and, and being able to recycle water, so it's a strong hydrological approach. Oops. At the same time, we're also um, really trying to rethink and help uh, understand what kind of trees and plants do we plant given our climate change. Uh, not all the trees uh, that originally did and were uh, original to Southern California are doing as well as they could. And so we're looking at the, the uh, ecologists across the Mediterranean biome to really um, try to uh, sort of look at uh, what the possibilities are in terms of. So we're planting, again, as I said, 5,000 trees alone in phase one and creating this destination. Um, and if you're all flying over uh, from and to LAX, uh, the hole is real and it's a happening thing. And the trees have been purchased. It's not like gonna maybe be. We've actually started pre-purchasing and growing the trees. So um, that is, uh, uh, tr has tremendous value. We're also using our own water uh, to, uh, to in the building. It's a, it's a building that actually is a very smart building and does a lot of great things. It's also gonna be used about 200 days out of the year for all sorts of activities. It's open to the community uh, for, many, uh, for many types of programs. And um, it's gonna be the place of one of the, uh, one of the uh, ceremonies for the Olympics. So, uh, which is uh, pretty great. Now finally, just in terms of green jobs, because my role here is to say, when uh, with Gary was speaking, and he obviously has a great way of, dis of uh, sort of sharing very complex information, I'm thinking, that's a green job. You know, uh, not, not, it's not only about sort of jobs out in the field in construction, it's about all the kind of technical jobs that you do. But, um, you know, we, we were trying to think of uh, landscape architects, hydrologists, geo uh, geoscientists, fish and game wardens, nursery industry, huge. There's not enough plants to do all the projects that we want to do in Southern California. We need to start growing them and we need to start addressing those issues. Um, then uh, civil engineers, uh, you know, obviously we're into clean transportation and fuels. All of you know those better. All I'm saying is that, of course, uh, we, we have sort of technical jobs, but we have to work hard with 
uh, universities, trade colleges, uh, city colleges, and really try to um, think big about what these, those job opportunities are. Um, a couple little projects to share of how, how this is Lincoln Heights Jail. Um, it, the project is called Las Alturas, and it was basically a proposal to the city to look at the jail, re build some new buildings, and create a, um, a, a new sort of environmental uh, center and green jobs in a sort of uh, community piece associated with it with new housing. It's a project that uh, Lincoln Properties is actually developing. Um, so here you see some of what could happen there, including, of course, agriculture, which we haven't talked about, I hadn't talked about for now. And then finally, a project that's going into the ground next year, and it's right next to a county uh, for, uh, park, Grand Park, and right next to it, and uh, looking and r looking from City Hall here down towards the site is uh, Fab. We call we're calling it fa Fab, like as in fabulous, but it's really First and Broadway, and uh, it's uh, two two and a, two and a quarter acres of uh, what the city hopes will be a demonstration. F uh, at the metropolitan, at the scale of the metropolitan area, by planting a, a, an urban forest and really celebrating water, celebrating art, and celebrating food. So we have three levels of food um, and restaurant, and uh, we are very excited about this project. We're collecting all the water from the adjacent streets. We're reclaiming uh, water. We're using photovoltaics um, to actually light the park in, at night. And of course, everybody needs um, everybody needs uh, some Instagrammable moments. So we have California poppies, stainless steel ones, up in the air, making us all smile um, as as art moments. And uh, with that. Uh, I would just like to conclude, landscape matters, water matters, ecology matters, parks matter, people matter, and usually I actually say policy matters, so I missed that one. Yeah, Thank you. That one. That's a good addition. Thank you, Mia. You've been busy. Mary, Leslie, please share with us your thoughts. I just want to say if I was doing it over, Mia, I feel properly inspired by your presentation and I would want to be a landscape architect, okay? <laughs> because that was amazing what you just showed. That is a lot, a lot of work and it's gonna make a huge difference in LA, just huge, okay. So um, I want to thank uh, Fran Pavley because without her work and the laws that were created and the good work of her associate, Mr. Roos, no doubt, and uh, Jake Levine there, we wouldn't be where we are today. It's made a huge difference here on the ground um, in the city of LA, in the county of LA. It's what gives us the air cover, huh? JR to do the reports we do about how we would take your ideas and make them real on the ground here. And we've really spent the last 10, 15 years trying to do that. So I, I think we should give you another round of applause. Um, now, for us, um, I, I'm, I'm the head of the Los Angeles Business Council. For those of you who don't know, it's about 500 members. We do economic and environmental sustainability. We work under the notion that you were talking about, Bob, that, 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 that good environmental policy is good economic policy. I think we've really proven that over and over again. You can go to our website and you can look at the Institute and you can see um, many of JR's studies and Manuel Pastor's studies and many other people's studies that really document how policies that have been put in place have translated to jobs and, and how this has reduced um, carbon and um, emissions in our environment. And I think what um, uh, Gary has done is Herculean, and I think we owe him a huge debt and his entire team because you did a really good job. The hard part now is, as my former employer, Mary Reardon, would say, okay, you're 5% there now. <laughs> now the hard work of the 95% implementation begins in earnest and um, that's the truth because I think a lot of what we've seen either works or doesn't work is in the implementation 
and you got to get it right on the ground, and you got to put a lot of really disparate pieces together to do it. And thank goodness we have LACI that, that is helping us now. It, it has been institutional. I will thank Michael Swords, who was formerly with UCLA and now with LACI for a lot of that as well. Um, what the LABC is focused on right now, really, um, and I should introduce my associate, Rory Stewart, who's here as well, way for it, um, is we're really focused on this translating of the net carbon buildings. You know, we, we think this is going to be a lot of work and a big uphill deal. Um, also expanding the rooftop solar that we began, thanks to, to a lot of laws you put in place, we had to our mayor in 06 signed Kyoto, Antonio Villaraigosa, and basically said we were going to do a gigawatt of solar at DWP. Actually, when he did that, it started a revolution I don't think anybody realized was actually happening. That, that you know, For DWP to decarbonize is huge. And we're, you know, and we're working on that zealously. The good news is um, uh, we're also working on making sure that this is an equitable situation um, city and countywide. So we're, we're involved in, in many activities. Um, one that involves the core, the conservation core, my associate here, um, in Sun Valley and Pacoima, where we're translating state, state cap and trade money, TCC money, into Pacoima and Sun Valley, where we're actually bringing clean energy solar to the rooftops there. Um, we're creating new jobs uh, as well. We're bringing new investment. We're reducing CO2 and GHG. So this, this is kind of, you've enabled all of this really through all these different programs because they're now they're really starting to translate on the ground. So what we see in, in, in this study, um, I, my personal favorites in Gary's study, or a plan, are uh, goal three, four, and seven. And the reason I like goal three, four, and seven the best is because uh, Rory told me I should no, because they they have they contain the housing goals. The housing goals, you know, this is an area that LABC has worked a lot on as well. Uh, um, the need for more affordable housing. This is not a new need. This is a ongoing need. But it's just gone exponentially worse. So this 585,000 units is critical. Hopefully combined with some work of Governor Newsom and the legislature, we'll be able to get some um, good work done in the next couple of years there. But on the ground here, um, we, we fully endorse that. It'll lead to a lot of jobs, um, for sure, for the building trades. Um, the clean energy goal. The clean energy goal, we know, we, we can factually back up uh, the county plan. We we know that these goals of 3,000 megawatts of new distributed generation will translate absolutely into thousands, tens of thousands of new jobs here in Los Angeles, and they'll be good paying jobs, and they'll be local. And so we we really like that. Also, the EV charging translates to many, as you know, JR, because you did a lot of studies on this, how many jobs the EV charging station. Now, the LABC represent a lot of building owners. We've been working with them for years. You know, It's sort of like the chicken and the egg, what comes first? Will people buy the EVs first? Or do employees have to provide the stations? So you know we go back and forth with this, but I think we're going to aggressively move out an infrastructure and electrify a lot of um, these buildings, particularly new buildings. Um, so with that, I think that's. I'll stick to my five minutes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to read about those three strategies that you selected there. All right, Sam, thank you very much for coming down. Does your microphone work? We're so thrilled while you're putting that on. Um, BYD is in LA County, and it, for those of you who don't know about Lancaster and some of the mayor's objectives there, not only do all their new homes, zero net energy, um, but they are manufacturing electric buses. So with that. Thank you. I guess this is the challenge of only going to one of the two schools. You went to both, so you know how to work the mic better. Uh, <laughs> that's probably true. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and thank you to the county for its leadership. Um, Sam Jamal with BYD, uh, you know, having spent some time in D.C., really is, especially on some of these issues, the local leadership matters, especially given what's going on in politics today, but more so to have some good, workable examples and to answer questions for the rest of the country on how do you actually do this. And so for me, this is a question that comes up a lot because I go to different parts of the country and talk to some of our partners as well as government agencies. And uh, you know, the question is, how's California doing it? Uh, you know, we have great policies in place, and uh, more continue to come. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had the airport shuttle bus rule, which is going to transition shuttle buses at airports to zero emissions. Uh, after earlier this year, we had the uh, transit buses 
transferring to zero admissions. And so you can see the state setting these high bars, but it's also putting funding in place to help folks be able to purchase these products. And so, uh, you know, I'll, I kind of want to step back and give a little bit about BYD, maybe a little bit broader because I've worked in some of this space, and then just a couple quick challenges before we get into the questions. Uh, one quick disclaimer, um, this is my last week at BYD, so I can be fully honest in the Q&A, um, <laughs> but also, um, uh, you know, it, it is a company that's doing a lot of great work in the county and in the region. Um, just down the street on 18th and Fig, um, you have the North American headquarters for BYD, and in Lancaster, over 850 smart union employees, not just smart union workers, but the smart union um, organized them. And so they're building zero emissions buses and helping assemble some zero emissions trucks. Um, and that's just a growth opportunity in both cases, because what BYD really specializes in is zero emissions buses and soon zero emissions trucks in the US market. And to date, 300 buses have been delivered from across, across the country from that Lancaster facility with 300 more on the way. On the truck side, there's a lot of interesting projects that are coming out of there, which I think is important as we talk about what the county can do and where there's some opportunities. Um, refuse Trucks is a big one. In Carson, they have one of our refuse trucks. Uh, in Palo Alto, they have one with three more on the way. And over in Seattle, Washington, there's a couple as well. And um, what's going on there in Palo Alto and Seattle is they're going to transition their entire fleets to zero emissions refuse trucks. And so you can start to see how cities can start to do some of this change and start to drive some of this change. Uh, in addition, you have yard tractors and drage trucks, which are huge on the ports and a huge part of the pollution and emissions conversation. And that's another area where you start to see projects over the next year come on board at different companies uh, and a whole bunch of opportunity there. I know the port's a big part of the leadership in the county as well. And, there's a necessary need to do a lot of that because of the air quality issues. And then lastly, not in California, but um, in New York, there's going to be a ref uh, zero emissions refrigerator truck that's going to start driving down in Manhattan. And so when you start to look at this, going to bigger picture a little bit, there's a lot of different defined routes that present real opportunities for zero emissions vehicles, whether it's the buses and having their different route structures or the refuse trucks, or when you're looking at a port or even across rail yards, when you have just the different tractors and trucks that literally are just going around the facility site moving operations. Uh, this is where the real growth and potential is. Airport shuttle bus rules, a great example where you literally have these vehicles that are just on that airport or just going to some of the parking structures. And I think the state's done a great job in pushing leadership on this. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, one of the things that's going to be important is that as we put those rules in place is funding certainty. Because one of the biggest challenges with all these vehicles, that, and it's an elephant in the room in some ways, is they're, they're expensive. Uh, we're not quite there yet in scaling. You know, when I mentioned BYD, it's 300 buses delivered. There are roughly 5,000 transit bus orders across the country each year. And so this is still a small segment of it. When you talk about you know, FedEx or UPS, they have hundreds of thousands in their fleets. And we're talking about maybe they're having tens or dozens in their orders. It's not picking on the companies. It's just the scale and scope of this transition is quite large. And we're still in the early stage. And so you know, state leadership and setting these rules is going to be critical. Um, local leadership in creating these RFPs and purchase orders is also going to be critical to have a steady market, but then also looking for ways to bridge that cost. California is great about this with the uh, different voucher programs we have. When you go to other states, they don't have those vouchers. And so what they're trying to do is encourage use, but for a lot of their customers, they can't really afford them yet. And so I think that's where this LA County plan, when you really look at this big picture, this is really an opportunity for global leadership, because if we can actually create a market here, and really transition these fleets, that's inevitably going to bring the cost down. And then these other states don't have to necessarily look at the size and scale of the California voucher, but they can look at helping curb that in incremental cost. And hopefully, we get a federal government that engages in this as well. And so what we're doing and what we're talking about can set the course on some big things. Because you can see some of these short-term routes transition very quickly. There's literally no reason why. City by city in the county, we're not pushing for zero emissions refuse trucks at this point. These are small, defined routes. We can do that. If we're doing the airports, we can do refuse trucks. If we're going to do transit buses by 2040, we can do refuse trucks. Uh, and so uh, that's you know one thing when we look at the bigger picture. And then just quickly, because I think we should get in the Q&A, um, uh, there are challenges. I think a big one's infrastructure. 
that's the elephant in the room in all yep. this as well. Uh, if we don't build the, you know, we're talking about charging these vehicles as well, and that's adding megawatts to the grid. And so, you know, having myself worked in the solar industry and been a part of the good, the bad, and the ugly of the solar coaster, I, I know that the energy conversation is going to be very tough to hit that target, extremely tough. And then we're also asking to transition all of our fleets and everything else to zero emissions. And so right now, we're asking two very big things. And so a big part of this equation is going to have to be infrastructure. When we look at how the money's spent, uh, you know, number one's got to be, can we charge these things and bring them on board? Um, I know in LA Metro, this conversation is going on this week of how do you bring on these buses? We, we are going to have to order more, but how do you bring them on if you can't charge them? And so, you know, that's going to be a big one. I think the other side of it, too, is making sure there's market certainty, consistently making those purchase orders as cities, as, as a county. Because what that does for whether it's a BYD uh, or any of the other companies in the space, it makes sure that you know, this is the home base and you're able to sell some of these products and hopefully get the price down to scale, but also sends a market signal to other states that are kind of dabbling in this stuff. Uh, you know, and so making sure that we're actually pushing forward as we d address the infrastructure side of things, as we make sure that the energy that's charging these things is clean, making sure we're putting those orders in because that does help move the market forward. And it also, just the last point, it helps create jobs. Um, just the past few weeks, we've been dealing with some issues in BYD in terms of Washington, D.C., and I dealt with similar issues in the solar industry where we had a market shut down in Nevada. And... You talk to workers that are entering these, space, these spaces. These are folks that this is the only job they've had a chance to have and give it a try. You know, they're learning how to weld as they join a company like BYD. They're getting trained on the job. And so when we look at the jobs challenge, we look at income inequality, which are real issues in the region. Uh, you know, this is a space, because the government's all in and because the investments are there, this really is a space that we can help uh, bridge some of that gap and create some of that equality of opportunity. And so I think that's where a lot of the excitement comes in is we can start to do some of these big things. We can actually start to create some of these good jobs. It's just it really is going to take an all hands on deck approach over the next few years. And then if we can get this right, especially over the next two years before we hopefully see some different perspectives in the, across the country, uh, we can essentially lay the roadmap out for the rest of the country and put the U.S. in the sense of back in that leadership role. So it's exciting to be here today, and thank you for this opportunity. Go from there. Yes, thank you very much. And <laughs> please thank our expert panelists. Because I'm watching the clock, because I tend to do that, um, I'm going to open it up for q and I had some questions, but Sam was sort of on that same um, focus that I was on, on challenges and opportunities, and you mentioned infrastructure and things that we need to pull this off. So let's open up to Q&A, and I'm looking at um, Francisca and Allison. Uh, we have some microphones, and what I would appreciate um, people doing, because I will watch the clock, and I'm turning it over to JR at noon, just grab the mic out of my hand and did that, um, is uh, your name and affiliation, and a quick question to uh, one of the panelists, preferably, and try not to make it a statement of t too long a time. So hands up, there's one hand there, and then right in front of her, we'll go there first. Hi, my name Thank is you. Michael Zelnicker. I'm with the Climate Reality Project. Good. Um, we're working on an initiative with LAUSD right now. Um, trying to transition them to 100% clean renewable energy. And in 2008, they um, installed about 21 megawatts of solar. They discontinued that program because LADWP discontinued a solar incentive program. So why hasn't that been reinstituted? Because that then takes away their excuse. And then secondly, I want to ask about electric buses because we want to electrify their fleet. Mm -hmm. And then. Th Thirdly, not to embarrass anybody, here we are at a sustainability event, and people are using single-use plastic, and I'm not sure what that's about. Thank you. All right. So did anyone want to answer one of those questions? Mary Leslie. First, the first one, the solar one. No. They didn't really take it away. They, they lowered the price. And, and, and the reason they lowered the price for net metered solar was to, to bring it more in line with, 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 with the price of solar. The price of solar had gone down so significantly, they needed to bring the price down, the installation 
uh, price. So I don't, I think LAUSD should look at DWP's programs now because there's some very good programs in there. There's a 14 and a half cent feed and tariff program that you can put on all your carports and do quite well with. Now, I wanted to sh uh, take one of those questions and shift it to Sam, too, oh. and that's on the school bus. And elect a lot of people, uh, parents as well as people in the educational system realize school districts don't have the money to make the investment on school buses. They should be transitioning to them. And kids spend hours on a bus, and it really affects health outcomes in the long term. So what's the challenge from your perspective on why we can't roll out more electric buses for school it's bus just, fleets? Some of it's the provider challenge. BYD doesn't do school buses. Um, there's a handful of companies that do. Um, this is something, ideally, as the county just sets the goal, you're going to see companies move into that. Uh, it, it goes, this goes back, and this is a defined route. This is one of the easy ones that we should have already done. Uh, I, I would also just put the plug in also when we're talking about charging stations and some of the infrastructure side, this should be done at schools and libraries. Uh, these are public facilities. It brings people back in there. People are there all day. We'll bring parents back into campus if they can charge their car, which is a good thing to have parents in schools. Uh, and so, you know, we really do, we should, LUSD is one of the largest budgets in the country. And just the size and scope and scale that's bigger than, I think, 45 other states in terms of its actual footprint. So we should be doing this. I think the state, there's conversations in Sacramento I know about creating the mandate. I don't think it even requires Sacramento to act so much as them just setting, we're going to transition our entire fleets. You're going to see companies, whether it's a BYD saying we're going to do this or other companies come into play there. California already has the vouchers. The voucher that we have, the HVIT program, is $150,000 per bus for incremental costs. It's a lot of money. That money is there and available. It's just a matter of folks seizing on it and putting those orders in. And, and I would say, especially if there are city folks in there, uh, you know, because I'm from Orange County and you see sometimes the lag and the purchase there, the money is not going to be there forever. And so it's kind of like get it while it's hot and take advantage of these vouchers. And so within LA County, like LUSD should be an earliest adopter in this because the money, there really is no financial question. You don't have to pass a bond measure to do this. The state's putting the money there. All right. Uh, this woman right nearby, Francisca, see her. And maybe one question okay. would be good well, instead of all three. Right. Hi, I'm Molly Baser. <laughs> I'm also a climate reality oh, leader, and good. I've created the Green Dream uh, campaign initiative for grassroots um, that we as leaders in the green sustainable movement that we live green and sustainable lives ourselves because how can we ask other people to do that when we are not doing it ourselves so it is about it's really for the group um about the plastic using plastic at events drinking out of plastic bottles when it is fossil fuel having plastic out on the tables and is the usc schwarzenegger institute green and sustainable itself um, and why isn't USC going green and sustainable and UCLA? Uh, whoever chooses to answer that, that would be great. Thank you. I, I'll take that as a statement, and we need, we need to do that. We've discussed that at the Schwarzenegger Institute. We need to be a model all the time, and so thank you for calling us out on that. We're going to, uh, businesses are starting to change. We're seeing the paper straws, getting rid of plastic. We need to get rid of plastic completely. We know it comes from fossil fuels, we get it. And so thank you for making us, put, putting that on our radar screen and don't hesitate to continue to do that. Appreciate your advocacy. Uh, another question over here. Uh, Mr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, BizFed, yes. right? <laughs> One, one of part of a part of a crew, uh, Gerard Wright, policy manager of LA County Business Federation. It's a question to uh, the landscape architect, uh, Mia Lehrer. You put the list of uh, green jobs and the possibilities that are up there. Most of them require a higher degree or, or better, and that's part of that disconnect too. What are ways that you are thinking of to at least bring it to the high school level, education level, so that they can see that potential and also make it easier to get that degree or that certi certification or whatever that is so we can actually bridge that gap. Thank you. Sorry, it was not me. 
meant to be a comprehensive <laughs> list, but thank you for bringing that up. Actually, as a firm, we visit you, uh, we visit high schools. Um, I had students from Roosevelt High, Roosevelt high School in our office, uh, 25 of them just yesterday. And I show them around the office and I show them a similar PowerPoint that would show, that, than what I showed you. And we're, we happen to be right next to the LA River. So um, I agree, but in, um, I also work uh, with LA Trade Tech and they're working really hard in that space. So I think it's not just higher, it, well, it's education, maybe not higher education, in some cases college bound, but it's uh, the trade schools are really important. And uh, I think they're, they've, they're, they've awoken. So I think um, it's about, uh, you know, just doing, a, a, trying to develop curriculum um, to really help them understand the potential. So, you know, does B, what is it? BYD. Does BYD go to these high school, uh, to these trade tech schools? Trade tech, 30,000 students, two block, about what is it, half a mile from here, between half a mile from here and half a mile from City Hall and the County Hall administration, and you'd be surprised how many people don't know that they're there. Um, and how Bob, many kids are living in cars that go to school? There. Bob Keefe from E2 had a, a comment to add into quick, that. That's a great question. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, we, we do a lot of work tracking clean energy job in the workforce and, and the challenges of that workforce all around the country. One of the things we do is we're a, uh, a sponsor, a co-sponsor with uh, the National Association of State Energy Officers of a, of a big report called the U.S. Energy Employment Report uh, that, uh, among other things, surveys something like 30,000 businesses in clean energy and other fields on what are the challenges. The biggest challenge right now for so many of these companies we hear over and over again is, work, is, is the availability of workforce. Something like 76% of all of the companies that we surveyed said that they had difficulty hiring uh, workers. And that's because the training is not there yet. It's not there in the, in the vocational schools. It's not there at the tech schools. It needs to be. Uh, I personally believe that it's, it's getting better. And uh, it's a su supply and demand thing as these jobs continue to grow. The education resources hopefully will continue to grow. But it is, it is an issue, and, and it's great that you raised that. As a legislator, I went to uh, city of Long Beach on a field trip once. They have a Long Beach Promise, which is a really a creative idea. And as a former teacher, I thought this was just a wonderful idea as well. But high school students can be summer interns for some of the biggest employers in the city of Long Beach. Uh, see what it's like, the job, what kind of job skills are there. And those students who finish their internship uh, get free tuition at Long Beach City College, and if they reach a certain <laughs> grade point or if they need to go on to a four-year school, a guaranteed admittance as well. So they're trying to come up with a creative way of providing their own workforce for the job skills that they need, and I think it's a successful model. I'm not sure if it'll work everywhere, but it's working in Long Beach. Sam, you had one last comment? Uh, yeah, I'd say on the BYD side, there's a success story of Lancaster on this with the Smart Union and BYD having an apprentice program in place. Um, that's a good model as the city and county starts to look at these procurements. There's a lot of ways to also incentivize this stuff. I think over the next decade on some of this, it's going to get harder politically when the real tough decisions have to get made, when you're having to shut things down and really transition businesses. If we don't get the equity equation right, both in terms of jobs and making sure that these technologies are in every community, that's going to be even more difficult because you already see the divides in Sacramento in terms of where folks actually are and where they publicly are and where they actually are on these issues. And so, you know, I, I think that hits the point of we got to make sure that access and jobs, as quickly as possible, we get to that point that you can see it in every community so you don't have folks sitting out of the conversation because it's not in their neighborhood. In fact, we did a study on this a couple of years ago about workforce readiness, and, and there was one high school that had a clean energy program in LAUSD, I think only one. one. Then there was two community colleges that kind of had some expertise in this area, 
both Trade Tech and, um, and East LA um, Community College were excellent. But compared, um, the union, IBEW uh, uh, 10, has a really good training um, facility um, here in the region um, that does a great job. And our, our nonprofits got into the business. GRID, Grid does a good job uh, training. And also some of our private guys have now been doing extensive training for both union and non-union workers on sort of the next the next iteration of Vista Switch and some other things. But compared to what we need, it's it's somewhat startling. The other thing that, that's somewhat that we should pay more attention to is how many of the utility workers are eligible for retirement right now. It's incredibly high. In fact, they were telling me at DWP the other day, like, you know, something like fifty eight percent of the senior management could walk out mm -hmm. tomorrow. Yeah, so so this is these are area, these are these are big areas, serious yeah. areas we yeah. should be paying attention to. And I think that's that ending is a perfect segue to panel two, <laughs> yeah, which is on go. workforce development. Yeah.